Welcome to the show with no names, just two guys that like to talk about cards and the culture. I'm Kevin Nagani from ESPN and Josh Luber from StockX, the founder, joining us now. And of course, Josh, you know, usually I'm the Philly guy that represents. And I I almost wore the Philly jersey and then you pull out the Schmidt, those baby blues. There's nothing better than those threats. Hey, man, there's nobody that I know will appreciate it more than you. And so I think this is going to start a trend. I got a whole closet full of stuff like this. So let's roll, man. All right, let's bring it. And we're going to start here, of course, on this show with the big news this week, and that is uh, Topps, the iconic uh, baseball card brand. Uh, they're going public with a special purpose acquisition company, otherwise known as SPAC. And when you look at the deal, it's valued over $1.1 billion. Mike Weiser, the former chairman and chief executive of Walt Disney uh, Company, will remain as the Topps chairman. Now, here's this. This is all about credibility in the digital space. This is all about the connection with tops and NFTs. And I think this is a home run. What are your initial thoughts? Maybe, you know, look, I am not a financial uh, advisor in any way. I have no uh, expertise to be able to evaluate financial IPOs. Uh, I have basically all my net worth in, in tops trading cards, not in top stock, all right? That said, um, it's great for the hobby. Uh, I don't know what it means as an investment. I think it's good that um, as like the, just the just the awareness that it creates of tops going public for the hobby, legitimizing it, you know, um, institutional capital coming into that. All that stuff is, is great for the hobby. How it plays out for tops as a business, who knows? But I'm bullish on all cards moving forward. So I think that's probably a good thing. And I bring up the NFTs because there's going to be so many NFTs popping up. Right. And, and literally. You can look at the percentage of NFTs and say, okay, maybe less than 2% will succeed long-term growth. Yep. When you have the name Tops, though, with it, and then you have the lic licensing deals with Major League Baseball, the NHL, MLS, and a lot of other connections with Disney, that's where, to me, it's like, okay, when you look at the NFT space, maybe this is the safest bet because of the name and the brand. We haven't seen yet the trading card companies marry uh, NFTs and digital with cards. So what does a digital card look like? What does an NFT card look like as opposed to just an NFT that is of the NBA? You know, Top Shot is a great example. It looks and feels like cards, but it's not. It is not a, a digital card. And so if this means that, you know, maybe Tops has some capital to invest in technology to create a digital trading card platform, cool. Let, let's see what they can build. Well, let's stay on the subject of tops because I think that's how we all got into the card industry because of that iconic brand and what they did with baseball. And, you know, listen, you're in your 40s. I'm in my 40s. We all started collecting in the mid 80s. And then, of course, that that baseball card upper deck, the Ken Griffey Jr. rookie is where we all felt we were going to be future millionaires. Right. And that's where it was like, all right, our, our passion for for collecting cards but when you look at the space now and and baseball season's underway and you look at the stars of the game right now and that is the Tatises and the Sotos and Acunas and of course the Mike Trouts and Otanis and the big names when I look at their cards and the space and the rookie cards here Josh something's just not computing value wise compared to baseball current stars I mean excuse me basketball current stars and football current stars how do you, how do you uh, break this down when you look at the space and understanding the hobby? What's amazing about this general topic in terms of the difference in value between uh, baseball cards and the rest of cards is that at the retail level, baseball's still number one. Baseball still outsells basketball just by a little bit, but football and, and hockey by a large margin at on the retail side. But on the secondary market, Basketball cards make up almost 90% of the value on the secondary market these days. And so when you look at the value of the top stars between baseball and and, uh, and particularly basketball, it's kind of not even close, right? I see you have a, a, a Mookie Betts back there and a Trout and a Soto, but like the Mookie Betts is a, is a great example, right? We did some research. We pulled some data from Card Ladder to try to find some comparable rookies in terms of population and year. So the bets is 2014. It has a population of uh, uh, of about 2,700, I think. 2013 Giannis uh, Prism, PSA 10, has a population right around the same thing. The Giannis card, which by the way is in a dip, is selling for about $3,500. And the bets card is only about $750. 
I mean, that's the be- that's the second best player in in baseball. Um, almost identical population in here, and it's what a quarter of the value of of the Giannis, and it's the same way across the board, right? Take a look at I see you have the Soto 2018 Soto up there as well, right? Uh, 2018 was Luca's year. Um, Soto and Luca both have massive populations over 16,000. The Soto PSA 10 sells for about 330 bucks, and the Luca PSA 10 is or uh, 1200 dollars. So that like four to five X difference between baseball cards and basketball cards kind of continues all the way through. So you really got to ask yourself, is it about the players? Is it about the sport? Is it about the collectors, the people in it? There's a lot of reasons of why that can happen. Here, here's one also, and, and, and the Mike Trout one is, is the one that I can identify most with in this conversation. Uh, obviously it's this rookie 2011, the update one. Yep. Uh, you can get this card for less than $5,000. And when you talk about Mike Trout, He's an iconic player. He's not just the best player in the game. He's a guy that's in the conversation of greatest of all time. Very similar to LeBron James. But then when you look at the value of this card and his rookie compared to LeBron's rookie, the Topps Chrome, I mean, that's a difference, like you mentioned, five times, right? I mean, five times more for the LeBron card. And I start to wonder, is it because he has yet to win a playoff series while LeBron has that conversation of being the greatest of all time with Michael Jordan because of how many rings he has. How do you translate that? Because, again, this is the card when it comes to specifically normal yep. average collectors who love baseball would like to have in their collection. 100%. I think the, the question that we ask ourselves around winning and titles um, is more sport-specific. So I think that dictates Trout's value relative to other baseball players. And I think the fact that, for example, Giannis's rookie is in a diff right now is a function of how they went out in the playoffs last year and, and people's thoughts on whether he will win a championship given that he's stayed in Milwaukee. I don't think that's really a, a, uh, a measuring stick of, of comparing sport to sport. I think the sport to sport comes with just the overall general popularity of the sport, NBA being global, baseball and football being U.S., and maybe it's about the, the collectors themselves, the, the people that are part of it. Baseball cards are so uh, historic. There's so much. We all grew up with baseball cards. So maybe those collectors are more collectors as opposed to, to investors in, on the basketball side. Maybe there's more investment money that's coming in. I don't love that distinction between collector and investor, but I do think there's something there about the baseball card collectors being maybe a bit more purist and they don't care maybe as much about the value of the card. I find it fascinating, the whole baseball conversation, especially when you look at iconic uh, players. And then that 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 translates to pitchers as well. Like specifically yeah. the, the Roger Clemens feels undervalued. The Greg Maddox feels undervalued. Every pitcher, every pitcher is, is massively undervalued, right? right? I mean, pitchers are, are are more important than anybody in, in, in baseball. So, but uh, that's, that's how people view pitchers. But I, I would, you know, to anybody that's collecting, collect what you like, collect what you love. But if you're looking at it from an investment standpoint, I do think vintage baseball is still underrated. And we always talk about the cards we're collecting right now. I, I actually think, I mean, it's not an SP foil. Come on, if I had an SP foil, that'd be really great. Uh, this Derek Jeter tops rookie, I think, is, is still undervalued. Uh, yeah. He's an icon. He's a Yankee, of course, uh, you know, an all-time great when it comes to the conversation of Yankee players. We know how the mantle's viewed. I'm not saying it's a mantle card, but I, I think that when it comes to iconic cards and iconic players, Jeter is one of those guys you got to have in your collection. I, I actually can't wait to get this graded eventually because yeah. uh, I, I, I picked this up and it, it feels it feels like it has you know sharp corners and a potential. I'm going to say nine because yeah. I want to undersell it in my own mind. What card do you have right now that you think you pulled out and you're like, yeah, this is this is a card that I'm holding on to? Well, I, I think just to. Uh, you know, tie it all together, right? So this is my oh. my Mike Schmidt PSA oh. nine uh, rookie. So um, this is a pop of 250. Um, I think it's selling for about $7,000 right now. I bought this about a year, year and a half ago um, once I started putting some more serious money into cards um, because this was by far the best card I had growing up. It was the most important card in my household uh, to have a, a Mike Schmidt rookie. My brother and I each had our own Mike Schmidt rookies. Uh, they weren't graded. You know, who knows what they would grade today. Um, but so when I had the opportunity to buy a PSA 9, you know, I, I jumped all over it. And at, at seven grand for a 1973 card in PSA 9 with a pop 250, um, that does feel, you know, super undervalued. But 
I'm never selling that card. I'm keeping it with my Schmidt jerseys and, and no, I'll keep heck that yeah. one forever. So. Because Josh, we all know it's the greatest third baseman of all time. That's right. Plain and simple. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've got some major FOMO staring at that card. I, I've seen some because I, I, I've, I've taken a look at that specific card. It's really hard with the centering and specifically the corners. So uh, well done for uh, getting a, a PSA 9 on, on Schmidt. The, the greatest third baseman of all time. Plenty more coming up uh, each and every week. Hey, if there's a topic that you guys want us to tackle, just drop a line here in the comment section. It'd be our pleasure to actually talk about it and chop it up, of course, long-term for people that love the hobby. Yep, and DM me if you got a Schmidt 9 to sell. <laughs> Shoot, DM me, you already got your 9. I want one of those. For Josh Luber, I'm Kevin Nagati. We'll see you next week.